Section 1.2, Mathematical Models. We say that y is a linear function of x if the graph of the function is a line. Slope-intercept form of the equation can be used to write a formula for the function as y equals f of x, where y is mx plus b. m is the slope of the line, and b is the y-intercept. I briefly mentioned this in the previous section, but now we actually have the definition. So for our first example, as dry air moves upward, it expands and cools. If the ground temperature is 20 degrees Celsius and the temperature at a height of one kilometer is 10 degrees Celsius, express the temperature T in degrees Celsius as a function of the height H in kilometers, assuming that a linear model is appropriate. Okay, so we know that this model is supposed to be linear, so we can write T equals mH plus B instead of Y equals mX plus B. But we also know that the temperature is 20 degrees uh, at a height of uh, zero because it's the ground temperature. So that means that 20 equals m times zero plus b. So that means that m times zero is just zero, so it's just 20 equals b. So now we know what b is. We also know that 10 is the temperature at one kilometer. So we have 10 equals m times one plus 20, because we know b is 20. So subtracting 20, we have negative 10 is our slope n. So now we have the equation. t, instead of uh, m, we can fill in the negative 10 that we solve for and keep our h. Instead of tw uh, b, we can fill in the 20 that we solve for. Okay, let's look at the second part. Draw the graph of the function in part A. What does the slope represent? So let's get a t-axis and an h-axis. We have a y-intercept of 20, so we'll start at 20. Let's say it tends around there. And we know that when the temperature is zero, this thing should be, the h should be two, because then we have negative 20 plus 20 is zero. Perfect, so let's put one over there, two over there, three over there, so we can draw it like that this. Yep, so it goes down 20 over 2, which is the same as going down 10 over 1. So that matches up with our slope. Okay, good, good, good. What does the slope represent? Well, the slope m is negative 10, and that means that it's going down 10 degrees for every 1 degree sorry, for every one kilometer that the height changes. So it's negative 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So that represents the rate of change. Of uh, temperature, capital T, with respect to height H. Okay, let's look at our last part. Since we have uh, our model, t equals negative 10h plus 20, we can plug in any height we want. So let's plug in 2.5. t equals negative 10 times h, but we'll replace that with 2.5 and add our 20, and we get negative five degrees Celsius. Let's move on. An empirical model is a model based entirely on collected data. For example, the table to the right lists the average carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere, measured in parts per million at Mauna Loa Observatory from 1980 to 2012. Let's use the data in the table to find a model for the carbon dioxide level. 
I think that one of the best ways to do this is with a calculator. So let's pull up our handy dandy calculator emulator. Go over to stat, hit enter for edit, and start typing our years into L1. And then we'll move over and type in our CO2 level into L2. Now that we have all our data in, let's see if we can plot this by going to stat plot second y equals. We'll hit enter to turn plot one on. And it looks like scatter plot is selected. So let's go to zoom. Status number nine. And we have a beautiful scatter plot. Let's see if I can grab that. Ah, oh, not bad. And let's see if we can take a look at what a linear model would look like. So we'll go back to stat and we'll go over to calc because it looks like this is going up in pretty much a straight line fashion. Let's get the linear regression number four. We'll use the data from L1 and L2. I would like to store this in the y equals section for y1. So let's go to variables, vars, pull up y variables, hit enter for functions and grab y1 and then we'll calculate it. Okay, so it looks like for mx plus b we have 1.71262 for m and then b is negative 3054.14 about. Let's take a look at what that looks like on the graph. Cool, so it is roughly linear. The line seems to fit it pretty well, so that should be a good model for this data. You can see that it put it in y equals for us. All right, so let's go back to that. And let's put that into this thing over here. So this is good for our data. Let's write m equals 1.71262. That was the A value from our calculator, but we're gonna rename that M, and then B is negative 3054.14, approximately. But the whole point is that our linear model is an approximation anyway. Let's write our complete uh, equation. Instead of Y, let's use C for CO2. Instead of x, we can use t for time, for the year. So we have 1.71262t minus 3054.14 in mx plus b form. Okay, let's use linear model from our example to estimate the average CO2 level for 1987 and to predict the level for the year 2020. According to this model, let's find out when the CO2 level will exceed 420 parts per million. So our model was C of t equals 1.71262t minus 3054. So let's plug in 1987. So that's C of... 1987, we're going to take 1.71262 and multiply that by 1987 for t and then subtract off 3054.14. If we plug that in the calculator, we should get approximately 348 point, oops, 0.84. Point okay, because we're looking at um, a year that's in between all of our years. See, uh, 1984, sorry, 1987 is in between 1986 and 1988, but it's not explicitly given in our table. We call that interpolation 
because we're pretty much guessing what the value would be if it was in the table and it's within values. We're going to now figure out the a prediction for the level for the year 2020 and that'll be uh, extrapolation because we're looking at uh, a year that's outside of our data range. A year's only went up to uh, 2012. So for C of 2020, we'll just do the same thing. 1.71262 times 2020 minus 3054.14 and that's approximately 405.35 and again this was an example of interpolation because we were looking at a year within our range and then this is an example of extrapolation because we're looking at a year outside in the future. Okay, we want to find out when our uh, model, when our C2 level will exceed 420 parts per million. So the whole point was our model was the CO2 level, that was what Y was. So let's look at that 1.71262T minus 3054.14. One four. We want this to be greater than 420. Okay, so we can add 3054.14 to both sides and then divide by 1.71262. So we should get that T is greater than 3474.14 over 1.71262 which is about 2028.55. So that means that by the year 2029, the CO2 level will exceed 420 parts per million. Let's finish that. Okay, let's move on. So a function P is called a polynomial if P of X equals a n x n plus a n minus one, x n minus one, and so on, all the way up until we get to a zero, where n is a non-negative integer, and the numbers a zero through a n are constants called the coefficients. And then we uh, call that leading coefficient a n the degree of the polynomial. Sorry, the n for the leading coefficient is the degree of the polynomial. Uh, this definition looks pretty scary because of all of the variables going on, but it really isn't that bad. All it's saying is that you've got x to some exponent. The exponent needs to be uh, an integer starting at 0. That's where you get this last term. That's when x is to the 0 power because that makes x to 0 become 1. And when you start with those integers, you just keep going up until you stop somewhere. And that's what n is. So for example, if we stop at 6 for this uh, first remark, 2x to the 6 minus x to the 4th and so on, that's a polynomial of degree 6. And uh, you have to stop somewhere in order to have a polynomial, but when you do, that's, that's pretty much it. All of these numbers out in front, like this coefficient in this case, is a6. And then this coefficient over here, the minus 1, is a4. So this coefficient at the end is a0. Okay, uh, polynomial of degree 1 is of the form p of x equals mx plus b. So y equals mx plus b is a polynomial. We call that uh, linear function as we've seen before. Polynomial of degree 2 is of the form p of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c and is called a quadratic function. Then we call a polynomial of degree 3 a cubic function, and I didn't write it, but degree 4 is quartic, degree 5 is quintic, etc. Let's move on. Example 4. 
A ball is dropped from the upper observation deck of the CN Tower 450 meters above the ground, and its height h above the ground is recorded at one second intervals in the table. Find a model to fit the data and use the model to predict the time at which the ball hits the ground. Uh, again, let's use our handy dandy calculator emulator. We'll go over to stat, edit. We'll go up, clear, go back down, left, up, clear, go back down. All right, now we're starting from scratch, that's good. Let's put in our data. Now that our data is in, let's go to zoom again for number nine. Okay, cool. Let's see if we can grab that. Nice. Okay. So, one second. Let's see. Okay, good. Let's. Hmm. Doesn't look like a linear model would fit this very well, but this kind of looks like an upside down version of that y equals x squared parabola that we graphed in the last section. So let's try a quadratic model for a second degree polynomial. Let's go back to stat, go to calc. Instead of linear regression, let's do five for quadratic regression. And again, I want to store this in y1. All right, let's see how it came out. Oh, wow. Definitely a good fit for the quadratic model. Look how nice that is. Okay, let's go back over here. I want this again. Because I got rid of it too soon. I didn't see it. Okay, so it looks like uh, A is negative 4.90 whatever. B is 0.962 whatever. And C is 449 point whatever. It's a good model for us. We can write that out. Thank you, calculator. So we have h for our height will be negative 4.90 approximately, t squared. That was our a, plus 0.96, that was our b. I'm using t instead of x, plus 449.36, and that was our c. Okay, we want to see uh, the time at which the ball hits the ground. So that'd be a height of zero. Okay, so if h is zero, then that means that this guy is zero, negative 4.9t squared plus 0.96t plus 449.36. That's zero. So it looks like this quadratic should be solved using the quadratic formula. So it's x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So plugging that in, we have negative 0.96 plus or minus the square root of 0.96 squared minus 4 times negative 4.90 times 449.36 all over 2 times negative 4.90. Using a calculator, we can see that t is approximately 9.67 for the plus part. We don't have to worry about the negative root because we're not time travelers. So that means that the ball hits the ground after about 9.7 seconds. Moving on, we have our next definitions. We say that a function of the form f of x equals x to the a, where a is a constant, is called a power function. So it's basically uh, a polynomial whenever you have that a equals n. However, sometimes um, that n could, I mean, that a could not be n where n is a positive integer. It could be almost any number, in which case 
uh, we have a couple of other uh, function names like uh, root function when a is 1 over n because then 1 over n we can rewrite using uh, nth root notation if a is minus 1 it becomes x to the minus 1 a reciprocal function if uh, a was minus 2 then it would be 1 over x squared so neither of those are polynomials but they are power functions okay so we have this uh, reciprocal power function in the picture on the right you can see that as x becomes bigger and bigger and bigger the denominator becomes bigger and bigger and bigger so that means the fraction gets super super tiny it's like 1 divided by you know 10 1 divided by 100 1 divided by a million very very tiny numbers as we keep going to the right but as x gets smaller and smaller then it's 1 divided by a smaller number like 1 divided by uh, 2 for example is just a half but 1 divided by 1 is bigger than a half 1 divided by uh, let's say a fraction will flip the fraction like 1 divided by a small number like a half that would equal 2 1 divided by an even smaller number like a tenth would equal 10 so the smaller we make the denominator the bigger this thing gets 1 divided by a millionth would be a million and then the exact same thing happens in reverse if we uh, look at negative x values. Then a rational function f is a ratio of two polynomials. So we have a polynomial in the numerator and a polynomial in the denominator. So as an example, the function f of x equals 2x to the fourth minus x squared plus 1 divided by x squared minus 4 is a rational function. The domain is all of the x values such that x is not equal to plus or minus 2 because then the denominator would be zero. So we have these dotted, these dashed lines for plus or minus two to show that x can't be anywhere over here. All those bad x values. Next up, a function f is called an algebraic function if it can be constructed using algebraic operations, such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and taking roots. Starting with polynomials, though. So, for example, uh, f of x equals square root of x squared plus 1 is not a polynomial. But because x squared plus 1 is a polynomial and we took a root, the function is algebraic. g of x equals x to the fourth minus 16x squared divided by x plus rad x plus that whole mess on the right that is also an algebraic function. It's not a polynomial, it's not a rational function because the denominator is not a polynomial, uh, nor the numerator if you were to add that part in the right. But because we did everything using addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, taking roots, it's still algebraic. Uh, next we have trigonometric functions. Those are functions of an angle that relate the angles of a triangle to the lengths of its sides. So this should all be familiar to you guys, the sine, cosine, and tangent functions are our most uh, familiar trigonometric functions. And our convention for our calculus sections is that radian measure will be always used unless we specifically say that we're going to use degrees or some other measure. So uh, you should recall that for all values of x, we have sine of x and cosine x are always between minus 1 and 1. Uh, it's the same thing as saying that the absolute value of sine and the absolute value of cosine are less than or equal to 1. You should also remember that these functions are periodic. So that means that the sine of an angle is the exact same thing as the sine of an angle that's 2 pi radians more, or 360 degrees more. For example, the sine of 0 is the same as the sine of 2 pi, or the, sine of, or the cosine of 0 is the same as the cosine of 360 degrees. Let's do an example. What is the domain of the function f of x equals 1 over 1 minus 2 cosine x. So we know that the only real problem for uh, fractions is when the denominator is 0. So let's look at when 1 minus 2 cosine x is 0. Well, that happens when cosine x is a half. We just uh, subtract 1 and divide by negative 2. So let's see, all of the x values when cosine is a half. Draw a unit circle really quick. Okay, one of my worst circles yet. 
Actually, that's so bad. I'm gonna try to reattempt it. All right, still pretty bad. So we're looking for cosine to be a half. So that's gonna be one of those 36 to 90 triangles. It's gonna be the one that makes cosine a little bit smaller. So it's all the way up there. Okay, so that's the point half rad three over two. We don't need the rad three over two though, because that would be for sine, but the half would be great for cosine. Okay, so remember the smaller triangle for 36 to 90 would be over here. That would be where sine is a half, and that would be at 30 degrees. This is the bigger one, so it's at 60 degrees, which is pi over three. So we have x is pi over three. However, uh, cosine is periodic, so that means that cosine would be the same if we went uh, 360 degrees all the way around, which is the same as two pi radians around, and any multiple thereof. So we have to include all multiples of two pi. So two, how about we call it uh, two n pi. And n is just uh, some integer. So n, any multiple of two pi would work. However, this is not the only place where cosine's a half. That also happens over here, the reflection. Right? The x value over here is still positive one half. So this happens at, let's see, over here it's pi over three. Over here would be another pi over three. So it's two pi over three, three pi over three, four pi over three, so five pi over three. So this happens x equals this, or x equals five pi over three plus two n pi. Okay, so let's write our domain. It's all of our x values such that x is not equal to those bad numbers, because that's what makes our denominator zero. Okay, lastly, we have exponential functions, or functions of the form f of x equals b to the x, where b is a base uh, positive constant. Logarithmic functions are functions of the form f of x equals log base b of x, where the base b is a positive constant. These functions are inverse functions of the exponential functions. We're gonna talk about inverses a little bit later, but for now, let's just uh, classify some examples. We're just gonna throw this definition in and talk about it more very soon. So f of x equals five to the x. We just gave this definition over here. Anything of the form b to the x is exponential. In this case, the base b is positive number, it's five. So this is an exponential function. Uh, this one we did a little bit earlier, g of x equals x to the fifth. That's just a power function. However, you could also call it a polynomial of degree five if you want, or a quintic. H of x equals one plus x over one minus square root of x. You might be tempted to say that that's a rational function, but one minus square root of x is not a polynomial because x to the one half is uh, x to a power that's not an integer. We only have integer powers of polynomials. So this thing is not rational, but it is algebraic still, because we're allowed to take roots for algebraic functions. Lastly, uh, u of t is one minus t plus five t to the fourth. That's just a quartic polynomial of degree four.